In summer, they catch salmon and salary in the southern part of the Sea of Okhotsk. In autumn, they go to the north. There are shoals of Pacific herring. We've squeezed several weeks into several dozen of minutes to show what it means to depend on the sea, to be devoted to it, and what it means to live on the sea. the north of the Sea of Okhotsk. On fishing maps, this place is marked as the fishing area 51. The floating base Vsevelod Sibirtsev has been operating here for almost a month, along with several trawler saners. The scheme is simple. Trawlers catch fish, which is then transferred to the floating base, where it is immediately processed. Reefer ships take the finished products away and bring food as well as containers for canned fish for the crew of Vsevelod Sibirtsev. That is, they are responsible for the communication between the factory and the shore. The main advantage of the floating base is that the production is as close as possible to fresh, untreated, so-called au naturel fish products. It takes five to six days for fishing vessels to sail from the fishing area to the developed infrastructure. During this time, all fish products that were caught can deteriorate. For this, there are processing bases, in particular, Vsevelod Sibirtsev. The floating base Sivelod Sibirtsev is difficult to compare with anything that moves. For example, it is two and a half times longer than the Airbus 380, the largest passenger aircraft in the world, and seven meters longer than the submarine of the Project 941, the famous Shark, the largest nuclear submarine cruiser on the planet. This may seem implausible, but Sivelod Sibirtsev is only a couple of dozen meters shorter than the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. From the bow, which is crowned by the bridge, to the stern, beneath which there is the engine room, the distance is around 100 meters. This is the distance the inhabitants of the bow need to cover to get to the gym, dining room, ward room, in general, all that we're used to calling amenities. Every detail of the floating base structure is well thought out. In the bow and the stern superstructures, there are the crew's living quarters. Moreover, cabins can be compared to cozy hotel rooms. In addition to the gym, there is a cinema, saunas, a swimming pool, and a hospital. On the first, second, and third decks, there is the working area, which is equipped with a real fish processing plant with conveyors for fish processing. And beneath it, there are four holds, each with three vertical rooms for the storage of finished products. The bridge is equipped with the most modern equipment, where all the parameters of the floating base are displayed, from speed to fuel reserves. The latest navigation equipment is also installed here. The most important man on Sibirtsev, as well as on any ship, is the captain. Only here, one more post is added to this one. It is the director with the corresponding extension of the responsibilities. It is such a complicated, complicated process. Pretty thorough, scrutinous, that's it. And here is the production manager, chief master, masters. And in the course of work, we have briefings, short meetings. Because this is production, that's the difference between the captain director and the captain. As a matter of fact, Valery Voloshin controls not only his own floating base. He, as an admiral in the Navy, 
must coordinate all the actions of the expedition members, captains of trawlers and carriers, and of course, report to the authorities on the ground. According to the project, Vsevolodsibirtsev has a high autonomy of navigation, 80 days, but in fact, it can be at sea for much longer. We may not take fuel for three to four months, you know? Well, just the same. We have food for half a year. There is enough, well, in the storerooms. Vsevolod Sibirtsev's fate has been hard. A couple of years ago, the owner nearly scrapped it. It seemed that even renovation at Chinese shipyards and significant investments in modernization could not ensure the normal functioning of such a ship in the 21st century. Russian entrepreneurs held a different point of view and weren't afraid to return the huge floating base to Russia. This is the only possible economic method, in my opinion, in my mind, for maintaining deep processing of Far Eastern fish products. Sevelod Sibirtsev was built a quarter of a century ago in Finland, specifically for Far Eastern fishermen. The factory ship became one of the three vessels of this type. For Finland, the construction of such an object for the Soviet Union, even at that time, was an important event. So this issue was approached thoroughly and seriously. The Finnish shipbuilders used the most modern equipment of the time. They tried to make the ship as convenient and practical as possible. Special attention was paid to security. It's built in such a way that, for example, if any two adjacent compartments are flooded, it remains afloat. That's it. Well, you can imagine, yeah, what it is. In other words, it is quite safe in that respect, and there are usually no fears. In the Soviet era, the factory ship was recognized many times as the best in the Far East. Then the big country was gone. Hard times came. A few years later, on the ground of unprofitability, Vsevelod Sibirtsev was sold for a song to Greece, nominally, but in fact, to China. In China, they wanted to make a fishing hotel out of the floating base. But then the Chinese scrapped the project. Its new owner, a fishing company Dobro Float, began to prepare the vessel for its return home. We started modernizing the plant. In other words, the plant was rebuilt. Since there weren't any conveyors, any freezers, there was nothing. We had to repair everything. The equipment was repaired in the engine room and on the working decks. In the plant, department's processing lines were restored and conveyors were fixed. And Vseva Lod Sibirtsev again resumed its duties. While Vsevelod Sibirtsev is operating in the so-called Area 51 of the Sea of Okhotsk, Garmonia, one of those reefer ships which run between the floating base and the coast, is being loaded in the port of Nakhotka. Soon it will go to sea to deliver provisions to Vsevelod Sibirtsev and pick up the finished products, frozen fish and canned food. The floating base is 1,300 miles or a few days' journey away. Soon after the processing, the products must be unloaded from the base in order to deliver them to the coast and then to the regions. Dobro Float has three ice class vessels built in Greece for the project Posiet. Reefer ships of the Project Posiet ships are unique in their own way. They can pass along the Northern Sea route, even without the help of icebreakers, which in August 2015 was brilliantly proved by Captain Vladimir Slizov. These are quite unique vessels. They are multi-purpose. Almost anything can be transported on these ships. From cars, 20-pound containers to frozen fish, vegetables, fruit. Mr. Vladimir Petrovich is considered one of the most efficient captains. At a rate of seven trips a year, he manages to make it up to 12, despite the weather and the risks associated with it. 
Yet, sailors do not even like the word risk. No one risks at sea. These are usual things, of course, with adjustments to the weather, with adjustments to some other factors, technical capabilities of the vessel. Of course, this is a hard job, and it looks like an extreme situation to those who are on the ground. But in fact, it looks quite different from the bridge. Garmonia has three holds with three levels each, and in each of the nine cargo tanks, it is possible to maintain individual temperature settings up to minus 28 degrees. It can carry 3,000 tons of cargo in total. It seems that there is even more on the dock. That's just how chaotic this box looks, stuffed with packing materials, bales of spices and various machines, whose purpose is hard to understand for non-pros. All of this is carried on board from the shore, under the crew's supervision. Caution, caution, and once again caution, because a ship is pretty well a dangerous means of transport. And here's the main thing, of course, is security. Compliance with security requirements in all aspects. Not every ship owner can afford to have teams of loaders in every port. So, judging by the autographs in the hold, people of different nations worked on Gardamonia. The ship can take up to half a thousand tons per day. So, you can handle the loading in 48 hours. But Gardamonia has been standing for a long time, and there seems to be no end to the cargo. This time, the holds will be filled with a little more than the half. And to improve the seaworthiness, it will have to take ballast. This task is solved by the chief mechanic. And plus 121, plus 123. Here, we need 860 tons of ballast. Garmonia can move at a speed of more than 15 knots and there will be enough fuel reserves even for a round-the-world cruise. Even now, there is enough fuel to cross the Sea of Okhotsk twice, but it's necessary to foresee an increase in fuel usage when the ship is returning with 300 tons of production. That immediately increases the load on the ship's power plant. That is, there is one compressor working, and if the products are poorly frozen, you have to use two compressors. These are additional and quite powerful electricity consumers. Plus, there are mechanisms that support the refreshment. Finally, the loading is finished. The hydraulic lines have been installed where the cargo doors are, and almost in total darkness, a tanker approaches Gardamonia. But now, of all times, the refueling hose is too short and can't reach the receiver. Stretch one of the ends to the stern. Well, in short, we need more people to the stern and the tank. It took the efforts of two crane operators and both deck crews so that the process of fueling finally began. As a result, pumping of 200 tons of mazout and 50 tons of so-called light diesel fuel is delayed until the morning, instead of the usual four to five hours. It seemed it was all. The ship can go. But the captain still has long negotiations ahead with the authorities, border control and customs. No, the ship isn't going to foreign ports, and the Sea of Okhotsk is considered internal. But a law is a law. So, armed with a bundle of documents as thick as a complete collection of Pushkin's works, Mr. Vladimir Petrovich is preparing to welcome the inspectors on board and lose a few more hours. Once again, considering the meteorological report and his own experience, Captain Slizov decides not to go directly to the floating base, but to make the route closer to the shore. In this case, there is a chance to encounter areas of small ice pieces. But Garbonia isn't afraid of ice. But such a maneuver will possibly help to bypass areas with stormy weather, so that the speed will be much higher and the cargo will be much safer. A 100-meter vessel is difficult to call small or compact. Nevertheless, you can't walk along it. Even seasoned sailors go out onto the deck only in helmets and, in addition to that, fasten themselves with carabiners to the lifelines to be reassured. The broadside is relatively low, so such precautions can't be considered superfluous. Such an expeditionary way of natural resource development was invented 
more than a century ago, and mainly for hunting and processing of whales. Whales were hunted in the polar latitudes far from the ports where it would be possible to do the processing. In the middle of the last century, huge flotillas numbering dozens of vessels sailed across the oceans. The Soviet fishing fleet was the most productive in the world. At the peak, fishermen extracted up to 11 million tons of fish and seafood a year. The peculiarity of Russian geography, especially its eastern, far eastern part, is that most of the coast is not populated. We almost lost the opportunity to process fish products on the coast. Most of the fish processing villages were founded regardless of the economic expediency and in Soviet times actually existed at public expense. Now life in them comes back with salmon fishing seasons. In the current situation, we took the same approach as the Soviet Union once took. The Soviet Union, despite the resources that were allocated to the development of the Far East, still focused on the construction of floating processing plants. A huge factory ship with a height of a 15-floor building processes up to 600 tons of fish every day in the sea. Sevalod Sibirtsev went on the next expedition a few months ago, has already passed thousands of nautical miles, and now works in the north of the Sea of Okhotsk. Several trawlers supply the floating base with raw materials, and communication with the coast is made possible with the help of reefer ships. Built in the Finnish shipyards for the Soviet fishing fleet, the world's largest floating factory was almost scrapped. But it was returned to Russia, and now this giant claimed to be the flagship of the country's fishing industry. Sievachotsk, fishing area 51, the giant floating factory of Sevalod Sibirtsev is in anticipation of the reefer ship Garmonia, which left Nakhotka and is carrying supplies. It will take the finished products from the floating base. Well, in any case, we always carry supplies, like some materials, transport passengers, for example, who have their contracts ended, who resigned because of an illness. In other words, in the direction of the floating base, the ships always go loaded with supplies. Now it's just the time to develop a plan to produce frozen fish and canned food and distribute the cargo through the holds. Yuri Arshinin, the production manager, is in charge of it. Logisticians work here. They get daily reports and see the space available on board so that we won't be stuffed with four tons and 68,000 boxes of cans. And then we will have to look for some room to put more. The captain of the floating base Valery Voloshin is a hereditary sailor. A reefer ship was even named after his father, the son of a man and a ship named after Captain Voloshin. He became a captain in 1985, but started at the end of the 70s on the whaling fleet. He doesn't think that his work is either simple or routine. There is a task plan. The company and the captain director have certain limits in each area. Well, this is the so-called Area 51. As soon as we reach the limits, we'll move on to another area. It is not easy to control such a floating base. Due to its huge size, the ship has large windage. At sea, the wind can reach the speed of 50 meters per second. In such conditions, the floating base must literally balance so as not to fall into the angle of list of more than two degrees. In order to comply with all these parameters, we have a strong ballast system. Yeah, 200 tons in, five tanks from each side. We are adjusting the angle of list. All mechanics on the ship are supervised by the chief mechanic, Igor Chek. Bearing the same name as a famous goalkeeper, he's been at sea since 1984. Sitting in the CCR, central control room of the power system, 
He's thinking about what won't cross the mind of an outsider, the importance of fresh water. There is a water distiller whose technical capacity is 455 tons a day. To produce even that amount of water, you need to spend seven tons of fuel a day. So the water becomes too expensive. A more modern and economical technology is implemented in a new generation desalination plant, which looks somewhat strange compared to the rest of the equipment. This device is built on the principle of so-called reverse osmosis. Its essence is the use of a special water permeable membrane, which holds sea salt back. The liquid that has passed through such a barrier is suitable for drinking. You only have to move it to the water supply system. And the sea salt concentrate, the so-called reject water, is just drained overboard. The power system of the Vsevolod Sibirtsev can be studied as in a visual aid right here, in the engine room. First, it's almost unnaturally clean here. And second, it's even simpler than a construction set for children. On the ship, there are two eight-cylinder engines with a capacity of 4,400 horsepower each. The combining gearbox ensures their operation simultaneously in pairs or separately, depending on what's needed. The shaft follows the gearbox, and the torque is transmitted to the propeller. Well, and perhaps most importantly, this is the fluid actuated clutch that allows you to switch the torque between the propeller shaft and the secondary electric generator. This is very helpful when you have to go at a very low speed of, say, one to two knots. The thing is that such medium-speed diesel-fueled engines don't work well without load. In a working day of the floating base, they need up to 40 tons of fuel, apart from other operating supplies. Moreover, even if the huge vessel is just drifting, fuel consumption is not reduced drastically because the main engines are not the main consumers of fuel. Basically, the fuel goes here. It is the refrigerator, the freezing complex. This is a huge load. This is the ship's course. Why? Because the floating base, in principle, is a structure that should stand. It's not for sailing somewhere. On each of such trays, there are 20 kilograms of fresh fish, which in minus 50 degrees in two and a half hours becomes fresh frozen. This is one of the three freezing complexes located on board of Sevalod Sibirtsev. And altogether, they raise energy consumption to a level of three megawatts. This is comparable to the capacity of the first nuclear power units. The world's first Obninsk nuclear power plant produced up to five megawatts of electricity. Vsevolod Sibirtsev manages it with only three diesel generators. The main thing is to have something to process. The factory ship can process up to 650 tons of fish per day, but the usual rate is about 500 tons, or in terms of the Pacific herring, one and a half million individuals. If you imagine that along the entire perimeter of this huge vessel, fishermen are standing with fishing rods with an interval of one meter, then in order to provide the floating factory with raw materials, each of them will have to pull out three fish every minute, and this is without a break for holiday days, weekends, sleep and lunch. A very busy schedule. Self-sustained extraction of raw materials, however, is possible. For example, it is possible to set traps on the world-famous king crab with the help of motorboats, which still haven't been used on the fishing deck. Well, fish are caught by special fishing vessels, which are part of the expedition. One of them is the trawler saner Kalinovka, led by Sergei Bova, a young 38-year-old captain. He took command of this ship recently. Before that, he had sailed on trawlers of the Project 420. They are 10 meters shorter. 
I'm here after the 420. One can say it's a cruiser compared to the Project 420. In addition to commanding the crew, searching for fish and delivering the catch to the shipping base, the captain also observes what is happening in the mining area. There is special equipment that figures out who competitors are, what they say about fishing. And when analyzing your ships and theirs, you are already making a decision where it's better to sail, where it is better to place the trawl. The information from the locators helps the captain. The sonar system has been installed for a year already. It is very effective in terms of searching for objects, such as sauri, herring. Right now it is clearly visible. There is a shoal of herring in our course, and we're trying to pursue the shoal on it. The obtained information determines not only the movement of small fishing vessels, even the huge floating base moves after the fish, all in order to speed up the delivery of fresh raw materials to the production and optimize the fuel consumption of the trawlers. We follow after the trawlers. All this is coordinated. We have communication between captains, roll calls. Well, in order to understand where every ship is, when the trawl started fishing, when it will choose the course, which catch they will get, and for what period of time, how much it has trawled. So everything in general is well organized. Meanwhile, the ship Gardamonia, which left Nahotka four days ago, has a few miles to cover to deliver supplies and pick up fish and canned food from Sevalotsibirtsev. According to the power to weight transport ratio, Gardamonia will easily handicap a huge floating plant. A two cycle diesel engine with a capacity of a 7,750 horsepower allows Gardamonia to go at more than 16 knots. And this is not the maximum, rather the so-called economical full stroke. The mechanical part of Gardamonia is under the supervision of Alexander Vadimovich Omelchenko, an experienced chief mechanic who spent more than 40 years at sea. The chief mechanic keeps the situation under control, even if there is no one at the helm. This isn't uncommon for modern ships. This is the autopilot's job. That is, the course is set. The gyro compass shows to the north. Our courses say the north zero. Our courses say 135 degrees. So, due to the interconnection of the gyro compass system, the tracking system, the vessel returns to its course if there is any deviation. The refrigerator installation is also the chief mechanic's responsibility. If he fails, the efforts of trawlers and processors will literally melt down. While there is no refrigerated cargo on board, the refrigerators are turned off and the refrigerator mechanics have an opportunity to carry out maintenance work that needs to be completed before approaching the floating base. After we begin to load the cargo, the refrigerator system is activated, and now it should work until the end of the full unloading. Therefore, they have a small amount of time. But trawler saners have none. Even if refrigerators were installed in the original project, they were dismantled to improve the cargo capacity. So, immediately after lifting of trawls, fishing vessels rush to stand under the right side of the floating base for unloading. One such grid, it is also called a braille net, holds about three tons of fish. A trawler brings to the board of the shipping base from 60 to over 100 tons at a time, which means that the crane operator will have to do a seemingly incredible trick at least 20 times. First, attach the braille net to the trawler's side, and then aim to unload onto the grate of the receiving hopper. And this is done regardless of the wind and waves. Actually, when you look at the way the tops of the trawler's masts move in all kinds of trajectories in the air, it just seems incredible that they have even managed to moor it.
and Gardemonia is hurrying to moor to the port side. In addition to packing material and food, there is another important resource on board, without which the work of the floating base is impossible. And that is factory workers. Sevelod Sibirtsev already appeared on the radar of Gardemonia. Now, instead of some pleasant activities, Captain Slizov and Valoshin will have to moor in the open sea. Mooring in the sea is different from mooring on the coast. There are no marine pilots, no tugs, which ensure the mooring. And, of course, every mooring is more like an art of the captains, who are on the bridges of these two vessels. In the meantime, the second assistant, Sergei Krivolapov, is busy negotiating the procedure for overloading the supply. Sergei Ivanovich, tell me what is your third, exactly on top? What kind of containers? Over. So, on top I have, so I have number seven. This is for herring, right? It is in the second room. In the third, I have shell and box. The weather, speaking the seaman language, is freshening every minute. And so, the captains aren't going to have a calm mooring. And the reload must be quick. However, the constructive feature of the ship can help here. The hatches on Garmonia are wide enough, if necessary, for a 20-foot container. Naturally, this allows to speed up the loading process of this vessel in the sea, increase productivity. The vessel can take or unload a cargo of up to 1,500 tons per day with the correct organization of work. For other types of vessels, as a rule, these figures are limited to 400 to 600 tons, not more. While the teams of Gardemonia and Sibirtsev are getting ready for mooring in the open sea, this moment is stressful for both captains and the crew. Course, 28. Ease to 24. Ease to 24. Slow astern. Slow astern. Stop engine. Stop engine. Halfway to the starboard. Halfway to the starboard. Forward. Forward. Midships. Midships. Stop engine. Stop engine. Those on Garmonia's tank. Let's do it. Great. Good job, everybody. That's it. Less than an hour has passed since the appearance of the floating base in sight to the well-deserved praise from the captain. Now it's time to give the supply and take the finished products. Time is precious. The wind is getting stronger. There is a feeling of a coming storm in the air. In the holds of the floating base, work is going on. On a steel platform, there are three tons of frozen fish, and all of this flies in a few centimeters from the head of a hold sailor. How he manages to remain calm, only the sea god knows. We know who is operating the crane, got used to him, how he works. And the crane is operated by Roman. He got on Sevelod Sibirtsev right after school, and at the age of 19, he became a crane operator. The factory ship has had several owners over the years, but for Roman, nothing has changed. He is still dedicated to his work. Well, all jobs here are equally hard, full of responsibility, because it's not a joke. Large loads, expensive products. We must be attentive, watch everywhere. Focusing on the gestures of the signalman, Roman with short finger movements causes the products to fly from side to side. And in addition, he answers my questions with the same short phrases. Any slightest inaccuracy and there will be victims. That's all you think about, only about this. Well, how to say, you gain experience over the years. You watch where the pendant is, what angle the swell has, where, what to catch. And you move and catch. 
Unlike Roman, his crane has worked in the USSR when a red flag with a sickle and hammer was swinging on the flagpoles of 253 factory ships. And there were also 33 projects of larger factory ships, which most of the time had interconnected professions, making canned and frozen food right in the sea. In total, there were 1,319 of such vessels. In addition, the Ministry of Fisheries held a fleet of 42 surface scientific vessels and two dozen submarines. And here you ask yourself a question, where did all of this go? But the answer is painfully obvious. It all collapsed together with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The thing is that the Soviet fishing industry was planned unprofitable, a situation absolutely unthinkable during the current market realities. Today, unprofitability would immediately put an end to the company's business. But still, here it is, a huge floating island in the middle of the Sea of Okhotsk, whose inhabitants, living in a hostile environment, extract and process natural resources. This is how a part of Soviet reality has reached our time, which is unlikely to be reproduced in the foreseeable future. I doubt that this is possible in the next, say, five to seven, maybe ten years. Because the economic situation doesn't allow us to recoup such a large-scale shipbuilding. Today, ships, which are two, two and a half, or three times smaller, are more popular. They can make profits according to the investment without long payback periods. However, Captains Voloshin, Slizov, and Bova certainly don't care about economics right now. There is a cyclone coming in the Sea of Okhotsk. The storm begins, the wind increases to 30 meters per second, and the waves grow to several meters. This is a threat of icing up not only for small vessels like trawlers, but also 100-meter ships. What was just a simple routine recently becomes deadly dangerous. The work has to be stopped. The ships are sent to the nearest storm shelter, the Shelting Bay. The Sea of Okhotsk. The Vsevolod Sibirtsev floating ship has been operating here for several months. The expedition also includes trawlers. They catch fish and fast reefer ships. They deliver finished products ashore, covering thousands of miles in a short time, regardless of the weather and season. Sevelod Sibirtsev is a huge construction, which is 179 meters long and has a displacement of more than 26,000 tons. In size, it's even bigger than the largest passenger aircraft, A380. In a day, the floating base can process about 600 tons of fish. For nine long months, it becomes not only a workplace for 435 crew members, but also their home at sea. We spent several weeks in the expedition and covered thousands of kilometers. And all of this is to understand what it means to live at sea. Vladivostok, Dobro Float's head office. It's not just removed from the place where Vsevolod Sibirtsev operates, it is even located near the waters of another sea, the Sea of Japan. Nevertheless, it is here where managers organize the work not only of the floating base, the size of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, but of the entire expedition. Fishing vessels that catch fish take it to the floating base and thereby shorten the delivery time of fish products for processing. That is, the production occurs directly at sea. The functioning of the floating factory also requires containers, spices, equipment, food for the crew. All this is delivered by special vessels, reefer ships. They also pick up finished products. One of these such vessels is Garmonia. 
In four days, the ship Gardamonia crossed the Sea of Okhotsk diagonally and moored to the port side of Sevalod Sibirtsev. Vladimir Slizov, the captain of Gardamonia, and Valery Valoshin, the captain director of the floating base, mastered mooring in the sea successfully, but the storm got in the way of planned unloading. It's common practice. The entire fleet, both the fishing ships and the floating factory, will most likely go to the Magadan region to hide from the bad weather. The weather. It is rarely favorable, especially in winter, autumn and winter. There are storms, so you never leave the bridge. The presence of the captain on the bridge during mooring is mandatory. The reverse process also does not do without a high-ranking ship supervisor. Now the ships have to unmoor in order to continue their joint work, but now in the area safe from the storm, in the Shelting Bay. Unloading can be carried out in sufficiently good weather. So if the weather conditions worsen, naturally we have to unmoor, wait for the weather to improve, and then make another attempt. More again to continue loading fish products. Once in the relatively calm waters of the Shelting Bay, the captain Slizov and Voloshin Yeah, so that you won't have to turn. Go as you do. The mooring process is going on like clockwork, and after several minutes, the unlock. The Shelting Bay is like an emergency shelter for everyone who is caught in a storm in the northern part of the Sea of Okhotsk. Usually, it is quite deserted. But now, in this relatively small bay, several dozen ships have gathered, including the fishing trawlers that operate with the Vsevolod Sibirtsev floating base. A strong wind is blowing here too, but the water is calm, so Garamonia again moored to the shipping base to fill two of its three holds with products. It's only two of the three because the third is still filled with what sailors call provisions, or more precisely, with packing materials and food both for the floating base and for the trawler saners. The problem is that the Russian legal system prohibits operations with similar cargoes in territorial waters. Therefore, as soon as the weather at sea improves, the ships will part so that Garmonia will be able to moor beyond the territorial waters. And only then the process of loading and unloading will continue. Trawler saners are fishing ships. They also need to wait out the storm. And this means that the stock of raw materials on Vsevolod Sibirtsev are rapidly decreasing, and in a few hours the conveyor belts of the factory ship will be empty. If the equipment is operational and there is enough electricity supply, the factory can stop only for two reasons. First, the warehouse is full, and second, there is a lack of raw materials. But regardless of the reasons, after mandatory sanitation in such cases, everything has to stop, and the factory turns from a source of income into a generator of losses. Losses, to put it mildly, are serious. 
Each day of such a huge floating base being at sea costs about 1 million rubles. But not only shareholders and managers are upset. Each employee of the enterprise, in addition to a relatively modest salary, also receives a bonus part, or the share. And the amount of this share depends on the quantity of products produced. In the sailor's language, it's called to earn from each tail. The only thing the team on Sibirtsev is thinking about is how to resume work as soon as possible. First of all, we need fish. First of all, we see that we have free space. We must go out with the fleet to fish, and this must be done, like, to lead everyone for fishing. But while the weather doesn't let the fishing expedition to sea, the crew of Sevelod Sibirtsev will not lose time. There is always a lot of work on a huge ship. In addition to sanitation, you need to deal with routine repairs, and no one canceled the loading of the ship. And now, finally, the waves in the open sea become lower, one and a half meters. And this means that saner trawlers can again go fishing and the head of production has to prepare to receive the catch. Gardamonia unmoored in order to moor to the floating base once again, but now at open sea. The work with the load will be finished later. It would have been wiser for us, let's say, to stop yesterday and go fishing and catch fish. And now as the weather calms down, we'll work again. We'll take supplies and then continue to unload it later. One hold is empty, we'll fill it. Special ships catch fish for the floating base. They are marked by the abbreviation STR. There is some French reverse word order in the way it is deciphered. Saner trawler refrigerator. The first two words mean that they can catch fish with different gear. And the letter R and, well, the corresponding word are inherited from the Soviet Union. Now there are now refrigerators. So when the net, which is overboard, is ascended to the platform, I hope it will be full of proper herring. The fish will be loaded into those tanks. They are called folds. The shelf life is very short, even in winter, just a few hours, up to 12. So the work pace of STR, or fishing ships, as they are called sometimes, is very fast. We can say like in sport. After delivering the first catch to the base after the storm, Sergei Bova takes his Kalinovka trawler to the place where other Dobro floats fishing ships saw shoals of herring. It takes four hours, so the crew sees the dawn while sailing. The straight eight-cylinder diesel engine has 1,320 horsepower. It's kind of a lot, but Kalinovka can't be called fast. At a maximum speed of 13 knots, we go to the fishing area at 10 knots. This STR Kalinovka was built as a part of the Project 503. It was one of the most popular in the Soviet era. With a length of just over 50 meters, this ship belongs to the medium tonnage, that is, far from being the smallest. But nevertheless, in comparison with the floating base, it is, of course, just a shell. And only here you can understand what the real sway is. Everyday conditions for the crew are also difficult to describe as comfortable. It's just small, but nevertheless, a team of 23 people will spend several months on this ship catching fish. And this is not even a record. One of the fishing ships that work with Sibirtsev has already been at sea for seven months and is not yet going back. In the GDR alone, nearly a thousand fishing vessels were commissioned by the Soviet Union in the first nine post-war years and built. On average, a ship was launched once in three days. The ships were also commissioned in Denmark, Finland, Greece, Japan. But Soviet shipbuilders kept up with it. Over 300 STRs of the Project 503 were built. Sergei Bova hasn't been on the Project 503 for a long time. Just a month ago, he came from a smaller fishing ship. 
Between the answers to my questions, he also manages to give commands to the officer on duty. There is a tension, as if we are participating in an unspoken competition on Trawler of Herring. However, this assumption, the captain rejected immediately. Nikolaich, 5.3. There were such situations, but now the company distributes shares equally between the ships so that each vessel can earn and fewer people will flee from ships. Five and three, just addressed to Nikolaich, is the propeller blade angle of attack. Like most trawlers, Kalinovka is equipped with a so-called ABP, adjustable blade propeller. This mechanism allows you to change the blade angle of attack, changing the thrust without changing the engine speed. By the way, in addition to the main engine, Project 530 STRs also have two side ones. Managing all this isn't a hard task for an experienced captain, but the captain of a fishing vessel is also a skilled fisherman. And this is just not being taught anywhere. Everything comes with experience. Well, of course, if anyone has experience, then all this is written down in notebooks, and eventually, when you become a commander, you open them and you read. Igor Valiev is one of those who has seen a lot and absorbed enough knowledge to take the position of a chief fishing master. He is also called the trawler master. This is not the executive officer, nor the captain's immediate assistant. But the importance of this position on a ship is hard to overestimate. It is he who knows all the details of setting up a trawl. It's something without which fishing is not possible. Trawls are different. They are, let's say. We're working with 107 now. The trawl's pattern is, well, different here. So you need to set HDD correctly so that it will open, load the bottom for the trawl to open and work normally. Well, the same is with the net, so that more fish will get into it, obviously. And Igor Yurevich gave a simplified version. After all, in fact, everything is much more complicated. The SDR is equipped with the so-called different depth trawl. This snare is intended for catching fish in the pelagic zone, that is, in the water layer where the herring lives. The trawl 107, Dobra Float's development, is called so because of the length of the upper and lower sets. They are, in simple terms, steel ropes holding the trawl's wings, whose task is to catch fish and send it to the net, to the tail part of the tackle. The upper set has bobbers. They are called fishing floats, and the lower set has a weight system. Well, HDD is a hydrodynamic device, a system of trawl boards and plates, which ensure the correct horizontal opening and position of the trawl in the water layer. The trawl is connected to the ship with wires or steel ropes, and all this needs to be adjusted and managed by the team. Well, let's say, no need to reinvent the wheel. They used to fish before. Sometimes you introduce some novelty, so... But in general, the setting of the trawl is described in the theory, yet in practice, you use some of your own methods. Something's wrong. You do it your own way. At this time, the captain is sitting in a compartment with screens of sonars, and therefore it's like the workplace of an aviation navigator or to a flight control center. Only now, it's not a satellite in orbit that is flying, but a trawl in the waters of the Sea of Okhotsk. Right now, it is clearly visible there is a shoal of herring in our course. And we're trying to pursue the shoal on it. We can't determine the shoal's density in our course. But if the color is red, then it should be dense. The trawl disappeared into the cold water, and now the captain keeps track of the fish entering the net. There shouldn't be too many, otherwise the tender herring will simply crumble. But of course, the crew wouldn't like to take out an empty net. This is a trawl control device. Everything's kind of simple here. The bottom is red. That's where the trawl is. Then there is the trawl's opening. This is the fish. The process of trawling demands increased attention and trained accuracy. Surfacing shouldn't be allowed, or the trawl will pass by the fish. Touching the bottom is also prohibited for environmental reasons. Moreover, it can tear the trawl. 
Well, if it's torn, it's torn. Nothing to do there. You've got to repair it, depending on the size of the tear. You can repair it for an hour or a four hours. Well, sometimes you tear the trawl, then you just roll it up and take a new one. Like, that one cannot be repaired. Well, to tear a trawl isn't so easy. It was hard for our ancestors. They could forecast the weather only by beliefs. Now, the storm cannot actually catch the sailors off guard. When approaching the base in 10, 15 miles away, there is internet access. We update. There is such a program as GRIB. It's pretty much applied to this area. We look at the wind, wave, wave height. Well, plus we take Japanese maps. Somehow, this is all difficult to understand. A trawler built in 1985, an abundance of color monitors and the internet here, in the middle of the cold sea, nine time zones away from Moscow. But there it is, and I even clearly see that the trawler works. It catches fish. There is a young but experienced captain who cares more about people than electronics. I look at people. Well, when I come here, I already understand them. On the shore, I do not understand people 100%. You can understand people only at work. When the ship is working, you have some working situations. And this is month after month, despite the weather, the duration of the expedition and your own mood. No, emotions never change. The only thing is that everything is familiar here. It's just psychologically hard. As they say, a confined space. The crew, how many people do we have? Several, like 25 people, let's say. The same people, all the time. And by the end of the expedition, you get bored with it. But anyway, you get used to everything. The trawler has been in the water for two hours, and the captain discontentedly says that the flow of fish has almost dried out. How much there is in the net is impossible to determine here, and the captain struggles with the temptation to take a reverse course to trawl this shoal again, but nevertheless decides to pick up the tackle. Zheka, take in sail. After the wires were chosen and the load thundered across the deck, multicolored trawl's wings appear. But here comes a problem. The cable of one of the sensors is tangled and doesn't let us continue. Together, we eliminate the problem, and finally, the net appears from the water. The net tightly packed with Pacific herring. Fishermen are happy. There are more than 80 tons. Take in sail. Stop. Wires. Of course, there is some kind of inner joy that there is a full net of fish. Naturally, when it is empty, well, somehow boring. And then there is already excitement of some kind. I want to put it in there again, catch more fish. Of course, it's all about making money, so to speak. Igor Yurievich easily performs acrobatic tricks on the tightly filled net, finding enough time to give orders to other sailors. This work is for experienced fishermen, and the best that I can do for them is just not to interfere. And at the same time, to think how soon I, as a person who spent most of my life on the shore, will want to be, if not on the shore, but on a ship a little bit bigger. And doesn't the captain want this? No, I still don't want to, because I'm excited about fishing. Therefore, I want to be a fisherman. Well, fishing, which at first did not impress, proved to be very successful. On board, there are more than 80 tons of herring. The folds are filled. And now Kalinovka is waiting for its turn to moor to the floating base and unload the catch onto the factory. Of course, I wasn't allowed to real fishing acrobatics to manipulate with the filled trawler. But instead, I managed to participate in untangling the gear, back up the sailors, and salt my hands in the Sea of Okhotsk. In general, I felt a sense of belonging. But most importantly, 
family, I know that here, under several layers of clothing, I have a key. The key is to the warm cabin at the floating base Psevagodsibirtsev, that is, to such a place which is spacious, cozy, does not swing, where there is heat and wireless internet and even a sauna. And very soon I will be there. And these guys will continue to work here. And they will work for more than one more month. During this time, the floating base has already managed to get closer to the fishing ship, and in less than an hour, Kalinovka will take place in the line for the delivery of the catch. The captain has a rare opportunity to sleep, but after four and a half hours in the darkness, he took his place at the control panel of the thruster propellers and moored to the starboard side of Sevalod Sibirtsev. The unloading of raw materials begins. Herring is sorted and sent to different shops. Bigger fish is for freezing, smaller fish is for canned food. But regardless of the fish size, it first gets processed. By the way, for a 21st century person, there seems to be a lot of manual work. However, this is the only way to achieve the necessary flexibility of production. Machines take up a lot of free space, and even on such a ship, it is not enough. And it's easier to teach a person than reprogram a machine. There are plenty of people, but people are going to make money without realizing until the end that it will be necessary to make great efforts in the sea before making money. And the efforts are both physical and psychological. The second, it seems, is more important than the first, because you can imagine how for several hours in raw, you do the same manipulations over and over. But you can't know the state of your mind will change during nine months, far from your family, from your friends. For that, you've got to have a lot of experience or a really developed imagination. Not everyone will cope. Here, they've got to be ready to come, be assigned to certain tasks and get started. Of course, a master will teach them how to do that. For example, how to clean or operate a machine. This is necessary and everything else depends on the person. Before getting on board of the ship, future factory workers are in the training center in the village of Yuzno Morskoy. Here, 1,500 people every year get knowledge and skills necessary for everyone in the fleet. Here, they are taught to extinguish fires and save products from combustion gases. For example, everyone must be able to put on a red rescue suit quickly. Without it, you cannot survive in the cold water. And to make sure of this, there is, let's say, a swift descent into the Sea of Okhotsk with the subsequent application of a storm ladder. Don't do this like a cat. Don't climb. Here, you grasp the rope and put this hand as high as possible. And also grasp the rope. Yes. But that's not all. After a jump into the water and a short rest on the life raft, an imitation of rescue with a helicopter is to be done. An electric winch is like an aircraft. Well, what can I say? In a sense, to be rescued isn't easier than to rescue. Sevalod Sibirtsev is not just a floating base. Its design is well thought out. Thus, living quarters are located in the bow and stern superstructures. Moreover, cabins can be compared to cozy hotel rooms. In addition to the gym, there is a cinema, saunas, a swimming pool, and even a hospital. The vast majority of ships have medical facilities and doctors. But when there are over 400 people on board and they are on the same ship for nine months, the likelihood of someone getting sick is inevitably approaching 100%. Therefore, there is not just a medical unit on Sibirsev, but an entire onboard clinic.
It's not just about the crew. Like mechanical workshops, Sevelutsebirtsev's medical facilities should serve the entire expedition. That is, if the ship's doctor, for example, on the trawler can't cope with the severe trauma, the victim is transported to the shipping base, and thus, sometimes a life is saved. Well, in general, harsh conditions at sea don't have many positive effects on one's health. Permanent living in damp conditions, in cold conditions, is perfect for the development and flaring up of chronic diseases. So hard to work on the floating base? It's time to check out for myself. Having dressed in the necessary overalls, I'm going to take my place at the conveyor belt. Now, I am a factory worker. You get used to the smell, oddly enough, pretty quickly. But something which is hard to get used to, at least for me, is this noise, which makes you want to run away immediately. Covering your ears with some headphones, for example, with classical music. It seems to me that something, something impressionistic would suit, for example, Stravinsky. But definitely not The Little Mermaid, no. After training, I moved to another site. By the way, changes here are constant. This allows to bring in at least some diversity in this generally very monotonous activity. I would gladly tell you something very exciting about this process. In fact, nothing exciting is here, although there are lots of tricks and experienced handlers clean the fish, in general, in two movements. But if I start doing this, I can easily cut one of my necessary fingers. And secondly, responsibility is a pressure for me, because I'm cleaning fish for the first time, and I understand perfectly that someone will eat the herring cleaned by me, maybe even me. And finally, for all the apparent simplicity of these operations, I personally do not understand how this can be done for 12 hours in a row every day, even if with short breaks. I can hardly imagine what kind of motivation is needed to endure all this for nine months. I'm starting to understand those who return to shore before the end of the contract. Even though there are, let's say, a gym and the internet, but still, people are in a confined space. By the standards of the fishing fleet, conditions on floating bases are considered to be comfortable, and Vsevolodsibirtsev is thought of as the most comfortable of all the ships. Most of the crew here live in double cabins. On all residential decks, there is a Wi-Fi network with Internet access. At least, here it is simply spacious. But if you can't imagine your life without a personal shower in your private cabin, then you have nothing to do in the fishing fleet. Natalia came to Primoria from Ufa. Since 2011, she's been going to sea, had time to work on short expeditions, and eventually decided on a long one. I'd say that living conditions in this company aren't bad. I also worked on a mini base, Kapitan Yefremov, also belonging to the same company in 2011, by the way. It was my first ship. Same conditions and meals are good. Kapitan Yefremov is one of those so-called mini-bases built for the project, Kamchatsky's Shelf. These vessels have a length of 126 meters and a displacement of about 9,000 tons. Modest indicators by the standards of Sevalod Sibirtsev. In total, six such bases were built between 1990 and 1995. Before Sevalod Sibirtsev appeared, it was the small floating bases that were the main marine production complexes of Dobrofloat. 
It was on such floating bases that the business processes and interaction of fish processing ships with fishing ships were worked out. And it was here that the 6-6 schedule was worked out, according to which all those who were engaged in processing the catch in the open seas lived and worked. That is, after a six-hour shift, the sailor received the same amount of rest time, after which the cycle was repeated. It is not easy to get used to such a schedule. There are such moments sometimes when people foreign to the sea don't get used to the fact that the ship rolls, that it influences the health somehow. They can't get used to that. They become seasick. We have to look for some compromises. In any case, people must adapt themselves to the work of the ship, not the ship to the people. So they get used to the sway. They get used to the sway of life. The mode of operation, which has proved itself at small floating bases, turned out to be unsuitable for a large factory ship that leaves the dock for most of the year. We, of course, worked all this time, six on, six off, but many simply couldn't stand it. They resigned. They left. And it was difficult not only for ordinary factory workers, but also for those who are responsible for organizing the whole process. For example, Yuri Arshinin, the head of the Vsevolod Sibirsev production, does not consider the 6-6 six -six schedule as universal. I think that 6-6 six -six is ineffective. 12-12 here is more and the productivity will be better, and you can demand from people, because they sleep, they have eight hours of continuous sleep. Let's say, food is good, there is personal hygiene, the cabin is in order, and so on. However, a 12-hour shift means a longer stay in the standing position, and often in the not most health-friendly conditions. And then there may be questions from doctors already. How does this work schedule, with 12-hour shifts, affect the health of the crew? Most of all, a prolonged static stress in a required position influences the health. So that's what Dobra Float's managers have to keep in mind all the time, being between Silla of workflow processes and Karibdis of workers' health. After all, people are a resource for the company no less valuable than unique vessels. Of course, it would be possible to adopt the shift schedule adopted in the military fleet at the time of Peter I. The shifts still have a duration of four hours, and breaks between them are eight hours long. Undoubtedly, there are also so-called extra shift duties for military seamen. But on the whole, this schedule seems more convenient. However, in order to make the work in three shifts possible, it would be necessary to increase the number of workers by one and a half times. And this is not in any way applicable to the size of even such a huge factory ship as Vsevolod Sibirtsev, nor to the parameters of the business plan. However, the sailors knew what they signed up for. Of course, if the person can't take it anymore, can't get used to the sway, to the conditions on board, there are such cases. We can send the person, if they want it, to shore, without any problems. Often, the only incentive to adapt is the financial one. Natalia, for example, doesn't even bother herself with comparing salaries at sea and on shore. She understands that you cannot earn for your own accommodation on shore. You work on the shore, you still spend that money, right? And let's say there's no opportunity to save up some money, for example, to have your own plans, some goals, and when you are in the sea, you return from the expedition and you get all your earnings. But you've still got to work to get all your earnings. That is, to work till the end of the expedition. And it's not so easy, even for those who understand what they got into. Even for them, the schedule is sometimes unbearable. However, it's not that easy to decide on the early termination of the contract. Not only will you not get your full salary, you will also experience some financial losses. Work at the floating base never stops. If there are no raw materials, there is an overload of supply or finished products. Vsevolod Sibirtsev has already left the territorial waters and is now in the exclusively economic zone of Russia. Now nothing prevents the overload of supplies, and one of the ships that provide the connection of the expedition with the shore, Garbonia, gives the cargo not only to the shipping base, but also to fishing vessels.
In order to capture three time zones at once, it is not necessary to get to a low Earth orbit. You just need to find the moment when the supply from the carry-away ship, here it is, Garmonia, is in the middle, is being unloaded both onto the floating base and a fishing ship. Garmonia's time is set as in Vladivostok. It corresponds to the home port and the location of the company's head office. Therefore, it's 1330 now on the ship. The fishing ship has the time zone of the region where it operates. So now it's two hours later on it, 1530. Well, and the floating base is between those two time zones. Therefore, here the ship's clock is set in accordance with the time zone, which is called UTC plus 11, that is 11 hours ahead of Greenwich, and eight more than in Moscow. As the head of the production promised, the unloading was quick, and just in a day, Garbonia is filling cargo hatches to set to the return course towards Nakhodka, leaving Veselov Sibirtsev behind, this huge factory ship, a part of the rich Soviet legacy. Not all such vessels have found a place in the recent history of the Russian fleet. It would have been just easier to declare fish processing factory ships a Soviet relic, turn a couple of them into museums and junk the rest. But these vessels are also jobs, that is, life for many hundreds and thousands of people who have chosen such work for themselves. A job that is very difficult to separate from life itself. But still, I couldn't help but ask our heroes, where is real life for them? At sea or on shore? Real life. Let's say the ship is the second home, of course. Family is the first home, ship is the second. Of course, on the shore. I just work here. I make money and the tip. Definitely in the sea. I've been a captain for 30 years. There aren't many vacations. Life is like that, just a few vacations. So I'm at sea. Real life is on shore. Here it is work. Of course, on shore, no doubt. Family is waiting, relatives, and my grandchildren. So life is better on shore. I think at sea. Firstly, I personally know everything at sea. At sea, there are no questions from which it would be necessary. Problems from which it would be necessary to escape, hide, flee somehow. There are no such things at sea. Real life is, of course, on shore. Here, it's kind of work. There is nostalgia, a wish to return. If there's been a long period, like three to four months, it's time to work, catch fish. Of course, the sea is exciting. First, it is the very process. Yes, it is very difficult at sea. But to be honest, sometimes there is no time to sleep. But days go by very quickly. It's real everywhere, both here and on shore. So there will be another day, and it will be January 1st. They will celebrate modestly. And already, at 10 minutes after midnight, Roman will take his place at the crane, Natalia at the conveyors. Yuri Vasilievich will supervise so that the production goes without failures. Vladimir Petrovich Slizov will confirm the navigation course to Nahodka, and Valery Mikhailovich Veloshin will take farewell of his colleague with a lingering signal. Sergei Bova will give an order to set the trawler controlled by Igor Veliev, and all of them will wait for the most important holiday for sailors, the day of their return to home. Then again, they'll go to the sea.